Hello there and welcome to the Unit 1 Summary video for AP Psychology. If you are a stressed AP Psychology student trying to remember everything from Unit 1, fear not, this video has got you covered. My name is Mr. Sin and today we're going to review all of the concepts that you need to know for biological basis of behavior. This unit focuses on how our biological system impacts our physical and mental actions and responses. Now, before we get started, I need you to click the link in the description of this video and get the study guide that goes along with the video. These notes are part of my ultimate review packet. This study guide will help you take notes on the video. And when you're done, you can make sure that you got all of the answers by going back to the ultimate review packet and looking at the answer key to check and make sure that you've got everything down. Trust me, you are going to want to take notes during this video because this unit is packed with an insane amount of terms and concepts and information that you need to know. Remember, the key to learning is being active, not passive. So now that you have your study guide out, let's start unit one off with an age-old question. What has the most impact on human behavior and mental processes, nature or nurture? Which, to be fair, this question's a little outdated. It's no longer nature or nurture, rather it's nature and nurture. Now when thinking of nature, think of heredity. This is the passing on of different physical and mental traits from one generation to another. And when thinking of nurture, think of environmental factors such as your family life, your social groups, education, or societal influences, just to name a few examples. If we look at heredity and the environment through the lens of different psychological perspectives, we can see that they stand on different sides sides of the debate. For instance, the evolutionary approach, which uses Darwin's theory of evolution as a basis for the approach, leans more towards the nature side of the debate. Charles Darwin focused on understanding how heredity and environment impacted an individual. Darwin created the theory of evolution, which stated that evolution happens by natural selection. Individual traits that are beneficial to a species survive and would be passed on, while undesirable traits would die off. Now, Darwin was not a psychologist, but his work became a fundamental pillar for the evolutionary approach of psychology. Unfortunately, some individuals have used the principles of the evolutionary approach to support discriminatory practices, such as eugenics, which is the belief in improving the genetic quality of the human population by selectively breeding for desirable traits and discouraging reproduction among those with traits considered undesirable. Individuals who are interested in exploring the relationship between heredity and the environment and their impact on shaping an individual's behaviors and mental processes may study epigenetics, which focuses focuses on how the environment and a person's behavior affect a person's genes and how they work. Here the focus is on how an individual's body reads a DNA sequence. The DNA itself is not changing. Epigenetics happens slowly. Here different genes are essentially being turned on or off due to sustained environmental pressures. Epigenetics can help explain why identical twins, which share nearly 100% of their genes, will often develop vastly different physical and mental characteristics. One study we can look at is the Minnesota study of twins reared apart, which examined the similarities and differences in identical twins who were separated at birth and raised in different environments. In fact, researchers have not only used twin studies to better understand the impact of heredity and the environment on an individual's behaviors and mental processes, but have also conducted family studies and adoption studies as well, such as the Colorado Adoption Project, which began in 1975. This longitudinal study follows the biological and adoptive families to gain insight into the influences that genetics and the environment play on the individual's cognitive abilities, personalities, and mental processes. Now, I do want to highlight that epigenetics is different from plasticity, which refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experiences. Generally, this involves the strengthening or weakening of neural connections. Plasticity allows our brains to be flexible and adapt to our changing experiences. For instance, as you're watching this video, you are building and strengthening your neural connections related to the information in Unit 1 from AP Psychology. Speaking of wonderful neural connections, the next part of this unit dives into the nervous system. To start, we need to differentiate between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. 
The central nervous system, or CNS for short, is made up of the brain and spinal cord. This system sends out orders to the body. While the peripheral nervous system, or PNS for short, consists of different nerves that branch off from the brain and spine. The peripheral nervous system connects the CNS to all of the body's organs and muscles. Our nervous system uses two types of nerves to deliver information. These nerves are known as afferent neurons, which are also called sensory neurons, and efferent neurons, which are also known as motor neurons. Afferent neurons send signals from the sensory receptors to the central nervous system, while efferent neurons send signals from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. If you need help remembering this, try remembering that afferent approaches the brain and efferent exits the brain. A for approach and E for exit. Now, make sure you're following along in your study guide because we are now going to break down the different parts of the peripheral nervous system. I will be honest, it's super easy to get confused here. But remember, you can do this and you will do this. To start, let's review the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system, also known as the skeletal nervous system, includes your five senses and skeletal muscle movements. These movements have happen consciously and voluntarily. While the autonomic nervous system controls involuntary activities, this is what makes sure that your heart keeps beating, your stomach keeps digesting, and you keep on breathing. You know, the important things that stop you from dying. I mean, if you think about it, it would actually be pretty terrible if you had to consciously think about breathing and your heart beating. Breathe, heartbeat, breathe, heartbeat, breathe, heartbeat, squirrel. Oh! Now the autonomic nervous system can be divided into two parts, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic system mobilizes your body and gets it ready for action. This makes your heart beat faster, your eyes dilate, and increases your breathing. Think about what happens when you see something scary. You don't actively try to make your heart beat faster, but you feel your heart beating rapidly in your chest anyway. This is known as your fight or flight. While the parasympathetic system relaxes the body. It slows your heart rate, increasing your digestion, and helps you focus on saving and storing energy. Both of these systems work together in emergencies to help with your fight or flight response. This is commonly referred to as the rest and digest. To remember parasympathetic, think of it as a parachute. It slows you down before you land on the ground. If you're still feeling a little shaky with the nervous system, don't worry. I've added some exclusive resources in the ultimate review packet, a video covering kind of the general mistakes mistakes that students make with the nervous system, and also a practice quiz that goes over the nervous system, and even breaks down the questions explaining why the answer is what it is, just to make sure that you can fully understand these concepts. All right, now comes the time to review the different parts of the neuron and review neural firing. Now there are two common types of neural cells that we are going to talk about. The first is glial cells, which provide structure, insulation, and communication, and waste transportation. These types of cells form the basis of the nervous system and are the building blocks of all behavior and mental processes. Glial cells are the most abundant cells in the nervous system and they support neurons through protection and also provide them with nutrients. It is important to note that these cells do not process information, which means they do not send any messages or signals for your body. Then there are neurons, which are the basic functional unit of the nervous system. Neurons communicate with each other by using electrical impulses and chemical signals to send information throughout the nervous system. Now, before we delve deeper into neurotransmitters and how neurons communicate and send signals between different neurons, we need to review three types of neurons that work together in the spinal cord. These neurons are what create a reflex arc. The reflex arc is a nerve pathway that allows the body to respond to a stimulus without thinking. It involves sensory neurons, motor neurons, and interneurons. Say you touch something hot. Your skin receptors detect the heat and send a signal through a sensory neuron to the spinal cord. The signal then goes to inner neurons, which are neurons within the brain and spinal cord. These neurons communicate internally and connect the sensory neurons to motor neurons within the CNS. Remember, we talked about sensory and motor neurons earlier in this video. Sensory neurons are also known as afferent neurons, and motor neurons are also known as efferent neurons. Now, when the signal goes to the motor neurons, it goes back to the muscles in the hand and arm to move, resulting in your hand being pulled away from the hot surface. 
All of this happens through the body's autonomic response. You do not even have to think about it. The reflex arc helps protect us. It allows the body to respond to a threat before processing what is going on. So now that we understand the reflex arc and how neurons within the central and peripheral nervous system work together to respond to external stimuli, let's review the process of neural transmission. But before we do, I want to highlight that if you do need a breakdown on the different structures and functions of the neuron, make sure to check out the exclusive review video in my ultimate review packet. In order for neurons to send a message, they need to receive enough stimulation that causes an action potential. An action potential is when a neuron fires and sends an impulse down the axon. In order for this to happen, you have to have positively charged and negatively charged ions. So your cell membranes separate the ions and creates an environment on either side of the barrier that is overall positive or negative. This is what gives your neurons potential. Some ions are able to cross the membrane more easily than others, which is a trait known as permeability. When a neuron is not sending a signal, it has more negative ions in the inside than the outside, which is known as resting potential. To trigger an action potential, a neuron must depolarize, which happens when an outside stimulus is strong enough to meet the threshold that causes depolarization to occur, and the neuron then fires an action potential. If the stimulus does not meet the threshold, there is no firing, and the neuron will return to its resting state. Remember, it's an all or nothing game here. The neuron will only fire if the threshold is met. When an action potential occurs, it sends a signal down the axon to other neurons in the nervous system. After that, a neuron goes through the process of repolarization, which brings the neuron back to resting potential. During this process, channels will be open to try and rebalance the charges by letting more positive ions back outside the cell membrane. When this is happening and the signal is moving down a neuron's axon, the neuron cannot respond to any other stimulus. This is known as the refractory period, which is a time period when the cell cannot fire and needs to wait until repolarization occurs and the cell goes back to resting potential. Now, once a signal makes its way down the axon of a neuron, it is sent down to the axon terminal, where the signal is converted and sent to another neuron through a small pocket of space between the axon terminal of one neuron and the dendrite of another neuron. This tiny space is known as the synapse. Speaking of the synapse, we can see that there are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. Chemical synapses use neurotransmitters, which are chemical messengers that send messages through the nervous system. Electrical synapses are for messages that need to be sent quickly and immediately. When neurotransmitters are sent, they diffuse through the synaptic gap to deliver their messages. The synaptic gap is a narrow space between two neurons, specifically the presynaptic terminal of one neuron and postsynaptic terminal of another neuron. The presynaptic terminal is the axon terminal of the neuron which converts the electrical signal to a chemical one and sends the neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap, while the postsynaptic terminal is where the neurotransmitters are accepted in the dendrite of the receiving neuron. Now once the neurotransmitters pass their message onto the postsynaptic neuron, they unbind with the receptors. Some of the neurotransmitters are destroyed and others get reabsorbed. The process of taking excess neurotransmitters left in the synaptic Synaptic gap is known as reuptake. This is when the sending neuron reabsorbs the extra neurotransmitters. Now, depending on what receptors the neurotransmitters bind to, we can see that the neuron will either get excited or become inhibited. Excitatory neurotransmitters will increase the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential through the depolarization process in the postsynaptic neuron, while an inhibitory neurotransmitter will decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential. This leads to hyperpolarization to occur, which is when the inside of the neuron becomes more negative, moving the neuron farther away from its threshold or intensity level needed for an action potential. When remembering these chain of events, remember that them in the following order. One, we have an action potential that sends a signal down the axon of the neuron to the presynaptic terminal. Two, channels in the axon terminal are opened and the neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic gap. Three, neurotransmitters diffuse through the synaptic gap and bind to receptor sites in the postsynaptic terminal. And four, neurotransmitters unbind with the receptors and some are destroyed and others go through the process of reuptake. Now, if this process gets disrupted, it can lead to neurological disorders such as multiple sclerosis or myasthenia gravis. 
Multiple sclerosis occurs when the myelin sheath is damaged, which disrupts the transmission of electrical signals, leading to symptoms like muscle weakness, coordination problems, and possibly fatigue. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder that affects the communication between nerves and muscles. Antibodies block or destroy acetylcholine receptors, preventing muscle contraction and causing muscle weakness and fatigue. If you need more help with the processes of neural transmission, don't forget to check out the exclusive resources inside the Ultimate Review Packet for more practice. Now, speaking of acetylcholine, let's review the different types of neurotransmitters and what they do. We can see that each neurotransmitter has a specific function which connects to different behaviors and mental processes. Acetylcholine enables muscle action, learning, and helps with memory. Substance P helps with transmitting pain signals from the sensory nerves to the C. CNS. Dopamine helps with movement, learning, attention, and emotion. Serotonin impacts an individual's hunger, sleep, arousal, and mood. Endorphins help with pain control and impact an individual's pain tolerance. Epinephrine helps with the body's response to high emotional situations and helps form memories. Norepinephrine increases your blood pressure, heartbreak, and alertness. Norepinephrine is part of the body's fight or flight response. Glutamate, on the other hand, is involved with long-term memory and learning. Lastly, GABA helps with sleep, movement, and slows down your nervous system. If we move outside the nervous system, we can see that the body also has different hormones that perform different functions, similar to neurotransmitters. Adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, helps with the body's response to high emotional situations. It expands air passages in the lungs, redistributes blood to muscles, and is involved in the body's fight or flight response. Leptin helps regulate energy balance by inhibiting hunger. It signals to the brain that the body has enough stored fat, reducing a person's appetite. While ghrelin, also known as the hunger hormone, signals to the brain that we are hungry and also helps promote the release of growth hormones. Melatonin is produced by the pineal gland in the brain and helps regulate the sleep-wake cycles, also known as circadian rhythms. Melatonin is released and helps promote sleep and is typically more prevalent in the evening in response to darkness. Lastly, there's oxytocin, which is produced in the hypothalamus and released by the pituitary gland. This hormone is also known as the love hormone because it promotes feelings of affection and emotional bonding. Now these hormones are part of the endocrine system, which is slower moving. It sends hormones throughout the body's blood to target larger areas of the body, all to help regulate different biological processes. This is different from the nervous system, which uses neurons to quickly send messages to localized areas of the body. In the AP Psychology exam, you do not need to know specific information about the glands of the endocrine system, minus a couple exceptions like the pituitary gland, but we'll talk about that later in this video. Okay, so now that we understand the different neurotransmitters and hormones that affect behavior and mental processes, let's explore how different psychoactive drugs affect behavior and mental processes. To start, let's review the difference between agonist and antagonist drugs. Agonist drugs increase the effectiveness of a neurotransmitter, while on the other hand, antagonist drugs decrease the effectiveness of a neurotransmitter. Agonists bind to the receptors that are in the synapse that are for neurotransmitters. These substances increase the effectiveness of the neurotransmitters by mimicking them and increasing the production of the neurotransmitter, or by blocking the reuptake that would usually absorb extra neurotransmitters, which makes them more available in the synapse. Antagonist drugs, on the other hand, work in multiple ways. They either block the neurotransmitters from being released from the presynaptic axon terminal, or they connect to the postsynaptic receptors and block the intended neurotransmitters from binding. Examples of agonist substances would be anti-anxiety medications such as Xanax, which increases the neurotransmitter known as GABA. This decreases neural activity and can calm people down. Prozac is another example of an agonist substance. It is used to treat depression. This agonist substance delays the reuptake of the neurotransmitter serotonin, making it more available for the body to use. One last example of an agonist substance would be opioids. We can also look at examples of antagonist substances. That would include medication for schizophrenia, which blocks dopamine receptors. Or we could also look at alcohol, which blocks the release of glutamate, which acts as a depressant for our nervous system. 
Now, different psychoactive drugs have different psychological and physiological effects on the body. Remember, psychoactive substances purposely alter an individual's perception, consciousness, or mood. These drugs can be broken down into a couple of different categories. Stimulants generally excite and promote neural activity. These drugs give an individual energy, reduce a person's appetite, and can cause them to become irritable. Examples of this would be caffeine, nicotine, or cocaine. Depressants are drugs that reduce neural activity in an individual. These drugs cause drowsiness, muscle relaxation, lowered breathing, and if abused, possibly death. Examples of depressants would include alcohol or sleeping pills. Hallucinogens include marijuana, peyote, or LSD. These drugs cause an individual to sense things that are not actually there. They can also reduce an individual's motivation and can lead to an individual to panic. And lastly, we have opioids, which function as a depressant, but have their own category due to their addictive nature. These give an individual pain relief. Examples of these would include morphine, heroin, or oxycodone. It is important to note that using different psychoactive drugs can lead a person to develop a higher tolerance, which would require more of the drug to be consumed to achieve the same effect. This could result in addiction and withdrawal symptoms. All right, now it's time to talk about the different structures of the brain. And I won't lie to you, this part of the video has a lot of information. So make sure you are taking notes in your study guide and pause the video if you need more time to write things down. When looking at the brain, we can see three major regions of the brain. Remember, these are regions of the brain and not necessarily specific structures. There's the hindbrain, which is located at the bottom of the brain. The midbrain, which is located in the center, sitting above the base of the brain. And our last region, which is the forebrain. The forebrain is the top of the brain and is what most people visualize about the brain when thinking about it. Let's explore the different structures of the brain that make up each of these regions, starting with the hindbrain. First up is the spinal cord. This is what connects your brain to the rest of your body. Think about this as the information highway. This allows for your nerves to send information to your brain and vice versa. Then there is the brain stem, which is located at the base of your brain on top of the spinal cord. It includes the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. If this is ever severely damaged, it will most likely result in death since it controls autonomic functions. The medulla oblongata is right above the spinal cord and below the pons. This helps with the regulation of a person's cardiovascular and respiratory systems. It also takes care of autonomic functions. The pons is the bridge between different areas of the nervous system. It can connects the medulla with the cerebellum and helps with coordinating movement. The pons also helps with sleep and dreams. Next is the reticular activating system, which is part of the reticular formation. This is a network of nerve cell bodies and fibers within the brainstem. This system is involved in the regulation of arousal, alertness, and sleep-wake cycles. The reticulating activating system also helps stimulate other brain structures when something important happens that needs our immediate attention. Located in the back of the brain, just below the occipital lobes and behind the pons, we have the cerebellum. This is what helps with coordinating voluntary movements, maintaining posture and balance, refining motor skills, and plays a role in cognitive functions. This part of the brain is sometimes referenced as the little brain. Our next region is the midbrain, which helps with processing visual and auditory information, motor control, and integrating sensory and motor pathways. There are no specific structures or things listed in the CD for this part of the brain, so we're not going to go in depth into the midbrain. But now we are going to change gears and talk about the forebrain. When picturing the brain, you're most likely thinking of the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain. The cerebrum is what deals with complex thoughts. We can divide the cerebrum into two hemispheres, the left and the right, and each hemisphere can be further subdivided into four different lobes. Now the cerebrum is made up of gray matter called the cerebral cortex and also white matter. The cerebral cortex is a thin outer layer of billions of nerve cells that cover the whole brain. Beneath the cerebral cortex is the corpus callosum, a thick band of nerve fibers that connect the two cerebral hemispheres. This is what allows your hemispheres to communicate with each other. Now I mentioned that we can break down each hemisphere into four different lobes. The first lobe we are going to talk about is the frontal lobe which is located just behind your forehead. This lobe deals with higher level thinking and is separated into two important areas. The prefrontal cortex, which deals with foresight, judgment, speech, and complex thought, and 
the motor cortex, which deals with voluntary movement and is located in the back of the frontal lobe. The left motor cortex controls movement on the right side of your body, and the right motor cortex controls movement on the left side of your body. This is an example of the brain's contralateral hemispheric organization, which refers to the way in which the brain's hemispheres control opposite sides of the body and processes sensory information. Visually, we can see the functions of the motor cortex represented by the motor homunculus, which shows a visual representation of the amount of brain area that is dedicated towards a specific body part. Now before we move on to the next lobe, I want to highlight Broca's area, which is found only in the left hemisphere in front of the motor cortex. This area of the brain is crucial for language production, particularly in controlling the movements of the muscles involved in speech. This area was first identified by Paul Broca. If this part of the brain is damaged, an individual will experience Broca's aphasia, which is the loss in ability to produce language. Individuals with Broca's aphasia can still understand language and speech, but will struggle to speak fluently. Up next is the parietal lobe, which is located in the upper part of the brain, right behind the frontal lobe. Here, the main function is to receive sensory information. This is what lets you understand things such as touch, pain, temperature, spatial orientation, the different senses, and helps with processing and organizing information. One part of the parietal lobe that I want to highlight is the somosensory cortex, which is situated parallel to and directly behind the motor cortex. This is responsible for processing touch, pressure, temperature, and body position. Remember, the left sensory cortex controls sensations for the right side of your body, and the right sensory cortex controls sensations for the left side of your body. Speaking of sensory information, we can visualize the amount of brain area that is dedicated towards specific body parts when looking Looking at the sensory homunculus. Now just below the parietal lobe we have the temporal lobe, which is located right above your ears. The temporal lobe is involved in processing auditory and linguistic information, recognizing faces, and assists with memory. Located within the temporal lobe is the hippocampus, which helps us learn and form memories. But remember, it is not where memories are stored. At the end of each arm of the hippocampus is the amygdala. These two round clusters are where you get your emotional reactions from. So you can thank your amygdala for your fear, anxiety, and aggression. Next is the auditory cortex, which is located in the superior temporal gyrus of the temporal lobe. This is what processes the different sounds that you hear and allows you to recognize things like music and speech. One other area that I want to highlight in the temporal lobe is Wernicke's area, typically located in the left temporal lobe. This area is responsible for creating meaningful speech. If this part of the brain is ever damaged, a person will lose the ability to create meaningful speech. This is known as Wernicke's aphasia. If we shift our focus over to the back of the brain, just above the cerebellum, we can see the occipital lobe, which is responsible for processing visual information. The occipital lobe contains the primary visual cortex, which is what receives visual input from the eyes. The occipital lobe not only processes basic information, but more complex visual tasks as well, such as recognizing objects, understanding spatial relationships, and perceiving depth and movement. Plus, the occipital lobe works with the parietal lobe and temporal lobe, which shows that vision does not confine to just one area of the brain. For instance, the occipital lobe may detect an object's color and shape. The temporal lobe helps with identifying the object, and the parietal lobe helps understand the spatial orientation. Speaking of sensory information, we also have to talk about the thalamus, which is located deep within the brain just above the brainstem. The thalamus receives sensory information from your sensory organs for everything except for the sense of smell. The thalamus relays information to the appropriate areas of the cerebral cortex for processing. This is why people often call the thalamus a relay station. For instance, visual information from the eye is sent to the thalamus, which is then relayed to the occipital lobe for visual processing. Now located on both sides of the thalamus is the limbic system, which is made up of different brain structures whose main function is emotions, learning, memory, and some of our basic drives. Some of the structures we've already talked about, such as the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. But I want to go into detail on one other structure of the limbic system, which is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus helps keep your body balanced and allows you to have homeostasis. This is also what controls your drive, such as thirst, hunger, temperature, and sex. 
The hypothalamus also works with the pituitary gland to regulate and control your hormones. The pituitary gland is often referenced as the master gland because it produces and releases hormones that regulate many bodily functions and controls other endocrine glands throughout the body. Today we know that the brain uses brain lateralization, which is the differing functions of the left and right hemisphere. Essentially, it is the division of labor between the two hemispheres. Each hemisphere has has different areas that it is more efficient in. At the end of the day, we all use both hemispheres to accomplish different tasks, and no one is simply just right brain or left brain. Overall, we can see that the brain does have hemispheric specialization, which we can see with the left hemisphere being better at recognizing words, letters, and interpreting language, while the right hemisphere is better at spatial concepts, facial recognition, and discerning direction. If you need more help with the different structures of the brain, you can check out my 1.4 video on YouTube or use the exclusive practice sheet and resources in the ultimate review packet. Now that we've talked about the different brain structures, it is time to look at how we can examine the brain. But before we get into neuroimaging techniques, I want to talk about Phineas Gage and split brain research. Both are unique and have helped us better understand the brain and its functions. Phineas Gage was a railroad worker who was injured when a tampening rod shot clean through his head. Now the crazy part of this story is that Phineas Gage lived and even walked away from the accident without any cognitive defects. But Phineas Gage did have a pretty severe personality change and it was discovered that it was because the rod had severed his limbic system. Remember, these areas are important for judgment and emotional regulation. Phineas Gage's accident allowed researchers to better understand different brain structures. Another way in which researchers gain insight into the brain is by studying split brain patients. Split brain patients go through a procedure that cuts the corpus callosum, which is what connects the left and right hemisphere of the brain. This is done to help treat people with severe epilepsy. When the corpus callosum is cut, the right and left hemisphere can no longer communicate. Patients who had the split brain procedure done do not see any impact or change with their personality or intelligence. Researchers studying split brain patients test for cortex specialization, which allows researchers to understand how different areas of the cerebral cortex are specialized for specific functions. For instance, researchers found that when patients were shown a word in their right visual field, the patient was able to say the word without any problem. But when the words were shown to the left visual field, the patient would say they did not see anything. However, even though the individual said they saw nothing, they could draw the word with their left hand. Once they drew the word then, they could identify it because now their right visual field would see the picture they drew. This is because the left hemisphere contains language. Remember, we have Broca's area and Wernicke's area located in the left hemisphere. This research allowed us to better understand the the different functions of each hemisphere and gave us insight into the different tasks that each hemisphere is more efficient in. Two other ways in which we have gained insight into different functions of the brain is with lesion studies and autopsies. Lesion studies are when doctors and researchers will destroy specific parts of the brain to gain insight into different functions of the brain. Today, this can be done to try and treat specific disorders. Autopsies, on the other hand, is an examination of an individual's body who has died to discover the cause of death. This allows individuals to better understand the extent of a disease, help determine the exact cause of death, and can also help provide important information for an individual's next of kin. As you can see, the brain is simply amazing. The human brain has the ability to change, modify itself, and even repair itself. This is known as neuroplasticity. Throughout our lives, we are constantly learning new skills, information, and growing. All of this can lead to neuroplasticity to occur. But unfortunately, we can also run into different situations which can lead to brain damage, such as infections, neurotoxins, genetic factors, head injuries, tumors, or even a stroke, just to name a few. Depending on the severity of the damage, the brain may or may not be able to recover, which can have life-altering impacts on an individual. Now, I mentioned earlier that the brain changes whenever we are learning. When we learn new information, or even when we practice old skills, the brain creates neural pathways. And the more you practice a skill, the more you study information, the more developed the pathways become. Now, we can gain insight into the brain by using different imaging techniques. 
For this class, you want to be familiar with two different techniques. The first is an EEG, which uses electrodes that are placed on the individual scalp. This allows researchers to record electrical signals from neurons firing, which can help with sleep and seizure research. And the second technique is an fMRI, which are similar to an MRI, but show metabolic functions. This can help with better understanding brain activity. This shows a much more detailed picture compared to other scans like a PET scan. So that's the brain. And now comes the time to talk about sleep. Hang in there, future psychologist, you are doing great. Trust me, I know this unit is packed with a lot of information, but you are doing amazing. Now comes the time to talk about sleep. And to start, we need to remember that when we are sleeping, we are still conscious. Consciousness is our awareness of ourselves and our environment. There's actually two types of consciousness that you want to be familiar with, wakefulness and sleep. Wakefulness is when we are awake. During this state, we are typically aware of our surroundings and can think, feel, and react to events. On the other hand, sleep involves a lower level of awareness. During this state, we are not fully aware of our surroundings, but our brains are still active and can process some information, like sounds or sensations. When trying to gain a better insight into our consciousness, we can look at cognitive neuroscience, which studies how brain activity is linked with cognition. Now we are going to focus on sleep and start by talking about your circadian rhythm. This is your biological clock that is about a 24 hour cycle and involves changing your blood pressure, internal temperature, hormones, and regulating your sleep-wake cycle. Our circadian rhythm impacts when we feel alert and awake and when we feel sleepy and ready for bed and over time we'll see it adjust with our age and our different life experiences. Now the circadian rhythm can become disrupted for a variety of reasons. For instance, if you start working the night shift and are up all night, or if you travel across time zones, your internal clock will almost become out of sync with the local time. This phenomenon is known as jet lag and it causes an individual to feel tired, disoriented, and sluggish. When we sleep, we go through different stages. By using an EEG, we can visualize different brain waves to help us understand which stage we are in. An EEG allows us to measure the frequencies of a wave, which is the number of waves per second, and the amplitude, which is the size of the wave. We can see that we have a variety of different waves. Alpha waves are slower waves that have a high amplitude. Then there's beta waves, which are low in amplitude and are the fastest brain waves. These generally occur when we're engaged in mental activities. Then there's theta waves, which have a greater amplitude compared to beta waves and alpha waves, and even a slower frequency. These are strong during times of relaxation. Lastly, there's delta waves, which have the greatest amplitude and the slowest frequency. These occur when you are most relaxed, oftentimes during the deepest levels of sleep. When looking at the stages of sleep, we can see we start with non-REM stage one. This is a very light sleep that only lasts about five to 10 minutes. Here your body will start to relax and your mind starts to slow. The most common waves during this stage are alpha waves. Next is a transitional stage, which is non-REM stage two. This lasts normally around 10 to 20 minutes. Here an individual will experience K-complexes and sleep spindles, which are bursts of neural activity. The most common waves are theta waves during this stage. After that, an individual moves into non-REM stage three. This is one of the deepest states of sleep and normally lasts around 30 minutes. Here, growth hormones are produced and an individual may experience sleepwalking or sleep talking. The most common waves during this stage are delta waves. Lastly, we have REM, which is the last stage and stands for rapid eye movement. Here, your external muscles are paralyzed while your internal muscles and structures become active. This is because your brain emits beta waves during this stage. Generally, this lasts about 10 minutes. Here, an individual may experience dreams or nightmares. REM sleep is considered paradoxical sleep since the brain waves during this stage are similar to wakefulness, but the body is at its most relaxed. As the sleep cycle progresses, the periods of REM sleep become longer and more frequent. Now let's say an individual is deprived of REM sleep. Say, for instance, they keep getting up in the middle of the night. Maybe it's because they're hungry or maybe it's because they have a crying baby at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., and 5 a.m. That for some reason just does not want to sleep. Hypothetically, of course. 
Well, they will experience REM deprivation, which may cause them to experience REM rebound, which means that the next time they sleep, they will enter REM sleep more quickly and also spend more time in REM to make up for the lost sleep. Now, before we move into dreams and sleep disorders, I want to quickly review hypnagogic sensations. These occur during non-REM stage one. This is when an individual experiences sensations that you imagine are real. These sensations happen when you are in a light sleep. For example, if you feel like you are falling in a dream, you may wake up quickly thinking that you're falling in real life. Speaking of dreams, we can see that there are a variety of different theories that seek to explain the purpose of dreams. The activation synthesis theory takes the perspective that dreams are the brain's way of making sense of random neural activity during sleep. When we enter REM sleep, we experience activity in our brain and the brain tries to make sense of this activity by creating a story or dream. The consolidation theory takes the perspective that dreams help process and strengthen our memories and experiences. While we sleep, especially during REM sleep, the brain organizes and strengthens the connections between neurons related to recent experiences and information. The consolidation theory focuses on the role of sleep in memory consolidation and learning. Dreams are merely a reflection of the brain's effort to process and integrate new information. Lastly, the restoration theory believes that we sleep because we get tired from daily activities and we sleep to restore our energy and resources. Today we can see that the memory consolidation theory and the restoration theory are two of the main current theories about why sleep occurs. All right, so we can see that sleep is crucial for the body's physical and mental restoration. And at the end of the day, we can see that we sleep for a variety of different reasons. Sleep is a way that we can protect ourselves as individuals. Different animals sleep for different lengths of time and at different times of day, depending on when they are active and when other threats may be out. Sleep helps in memory consolidation. It allows the body to strengthen the neural pathways, allowing for better recall in the future. Sleep also supports growth and conserves energy. When we sleep, we are able to conserve our energy and save it for when we need it during the day. We can also see that when we sleep, the pituitary gland releases growth hormones, which help with muscle development. Lastly, sleep and dreams can help an individual become more creative. Many individuals talk about the benefits of thinking about a problem before they go to bed or reference their dreams as what sparked their curiosity about an idea. We all need sleep to be able to be our best selves. But unfortunately, sometimes we can struggle with falling asleep or even staying asleep. We can see that many people will suffer at some point in their lives with insomnia, which is a sleeping disorder where an individual will have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. This can be caused due to stress, pain, medication, or an irregular sleep schedule. Another sleeping disorder is sleep apnea, which is when an individual has a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep because they are struggling with their breathing. This prevents an individual from being able to get a good night's sleep and go into REM since they keep waking up due to their breathing problems. The next disorder is REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a condition where a person acts out their dreams during REM sleep. Normally the body is paralyzed during REM sleep, but in RBD, this paralysis is absent or possibly incomplete. Individuals with RBD may be at risk for self-injury since they may leave their bed and could get hurt when acting out their dreams. Speaking of getting out of bed, the next disorder is sandambulism, more commonly known as sleepwalking. This is a disorder where a person gets up and walks around while still sleeping. This most commonly occurs during stage three sleep, when an individual is in the deep sleep. It's more common in children, but can also occur in adults. There are also sleep terrors or night terrors, which is when an individual will experience intense fear while sleeping, which can cause an individual to experience sleep deprivation and a disrupted sleep schedule. Lastly, even though it's rare, there is narcolepsy. Here, individuals will struggle to sleep at night and will uncontrollably fall asleep during the day. Now, I realize I, I keep saying this, but I have added more exclusive resources inside the Ultimate Review Packet to help you with the sleep stages, theories, and also sleep disorders. So if you do need more practice, check out the packet after this video to test yourself on what you've learned. Check the answers also to the study guide and review any specific concepts from this unit that you may be struggling with. Trust me, the Ultimate Review Packet will help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam.
All right, we made it to the last section of unit one, which is all about sensation. Also, if you made it this far in the video and you have not subscribed yet, what are you doing? What are you waiting for? It's free and it's a great way to support the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when future videos get posted. Now, sensation is the process of detecting information from the environment. Now, this is different from perception, which we'll talk more about later in unit two. Whenever you are taking an outside stimulus through one of your senses, you activate your sensory neurons, which end up creating creating a sensation for you. This is known as sensory transduction. But in order for you to experience a sensation, you need to hit the absolute threshold, which is the smallest amount of stimulation needed for you to notice a sensation at least 50% of the time. Sometimes we may miss a stimulus because we have experienced sensory adaptation, which is different from habituation. Sensory adaptation happens when we have a stimulus that is continuous and doesn't change. For example, if you light a candle in a room, at first you can smell it, but as the day goes on, eventually you can no longer smell the candle. But if someone else comes into the room, they will smell it right away. Habituation, on the other hand, is when you are repeatedly exposed to a stimulus and start to have a reduced response to the stimulus. For instance, the first time a person does drugs, they might get a strong reaction from the drug. But if they continue to use the drug, they will need to take more and more of the drug to feel the same effect. Remember, with habituation, you are learning from a repeated stimulus, which then results in a decrease in your responsiveness to the stimulus. And with sensory adaptation, you are getting used to an unchanging stimulus. Another concept that you want to be familiar with when it comes to detecting changes in stimuli is the difference threshold. This is the minimum change between two stimuli that is needed to cause an individual to detect the change. For instance, if you turn the sound up in your car or on your computer, can you tell the difference between each of the different volumes? At what point can you no longer tell the difference? When trying to understand the difference threshold, we can look at the Weber-Fechner law, which is the idea that for us to notice a difference between two stimuli, the two stimuli must differ by a constant percent, not a constant amount. For example, if I drop one drop of water in an empty glass, you would be able to tell that there is one drop. But if I have a glass that is half full and I add one more drop, you will not be able to see the drop nor see that the glass is one drop fuller. Now, whenever we experience something in life, our senses take in a variety of information. When our sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell work together, it's known as sensory interaction. Our senses don't operate in isolation. They constantly influence each other to help us understand and respond to the world around us. For instance, have you ever tried to eat Skittles without your smell? Try it. The next time you eat some Skittles, plug your nose. What you'll find is that each color of Skittle has the same taste. But if you eat Skittles while also smelling them, you will experience different flavors for the different Skittles. So we're about to break down the different sensory systems, starting with our visual sensory system. But before we do that, I wanna quickly review synesthesia. This is a neurological condition where one sense is experienced through another. For example, a person with synesthesia might see colors when they hear music or taste flavors when they read words in a book. All right, now comes the time to break down the different sensory systems. To start, we are going to talk about our visual sensory system and talk about the eye. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to review each of the different parts of the eye. Instead, I'm only going to reference the parts of the eye that are specifically listed in the CED. But if you would like a review on the different structures of the eye, you can check out the exclusive video in the ultimate review packet that does just that. Whenever light enters the eye through the cornea, it passes through the pupil where the lens focuses the light onto the retina at the back of the eye. The retina is made up of layers of light-sensitive cells known as photoreceptors. These convert the light into neural impulses that allow for the brain to process what the eye is seeing. When the retina captures light and visual information, transduction occurs. The cells convert the light into electrical signals, which are sent to the brain for processing. The neural impulses travel through the optic nerve from the eye, briefly stop at the thalamus, then travel to the primary visual cortex, where the information will be processed in the occipital lobe. Now there is a small area of the retina where there are no photoreceptors. This is where the optic nerve is located. Since there are no light detecting cells in this area, it creates a small gap in our visual field. This spot is known as the blind spot since visual information can't be captured here. However, we normally do not notice this because our brain fills in the missing information from the other eye and surrounding area. Now, since I mentioned photoreceptors, we need to talk about rods and cones, which are the two types of photoreceptors located in the eye that help convert light into neural impulses. 
Rods are mainly located in the periphery of the retina, and cones are mainly located in the fovea, which is a small depression in the back of the retina. Cones are what allow you to see fine details. They allow you to have clear vision and help you see color, while rods are visual receptors that allow you to see in dim light, but do not provide any color information. If we change gears and talk about our colors, we can look at the trichromatic theory and opponent processing theory to explain our color vision. The trichromatic theory states that individuals are able to see color because different wavelengths of light stimulate combinations of three color receptors. Photoreceptors work in teams of three, red, green, and blue. While the opponent processing theory complements the trichromatic theory, this theory states that information that is received from the cones is sent to ganglion cell. This causes some neurons to become excited and others inhibited. According to the opponent processing theory, color vision is based on three color pairings, red and green, blue and yellow, and black and white. The opponent processing theory also explains the phenomenon known as after images which occurs when you stare at an image for a prolonged period of time. As you look at the image, the active ganglion cells responding to certain colors start to become fatigued. Then when you look at a neutral background, the fatigued cells do not respond as strongly, while the opposing cells become more active, creating an after image in complementary colors. Did it work? Were you able to see it? Let me know in the comments down below. Speaking of color, we have to talk about wavelength and amplitude. We can see that cooler colors have a shorter wavelength and warmer colors have a longer wavelength, while amplitude of the wavelength determines the brightness of the color. For instance, blue has short wavelengths and green has medium wavelengths while red has longer wavelengths. Remember, short wavelength means high frequency and cooler colors, while long wavelength means low frequency and warmer colors. And the greater the amplitude, the brighter the colors, while the smaller the amplitude, the duller the colors. Now, since we're talking about colors, we have to also talk about color blindness. People who have achromatism will only be able to see black, white, and gray because they lack retinal cones, while individuals who only possess two of the three types of retinal cones may have dichromatism, which may lead an individual to become confused between certain colors. The most common type is red-green color blindness. If an individual cannot see different colors, it is known as monochromatism. This is due, due to the absence or malfunction of cone cells in the retina, resulting in the individual seeing everything in different shades of one color. Lastly, if an individual is able to see all of the colors, they have trichromatism. Another important concept related to our eyes and vision is accommodation, which refers to the eye's ability to change shape to focus light onto the retina, allowing us to see objects clearly at different distances. Now, if the lens focuses light in front of the retina, distant objects appear blurry, a condition known as myopia or nearsightedness. On the other hand, if the lens focuses light behind the retina, close objects appear blurry, a condition called hyperopia or farsightedness. Remember, nearsightedness happens when the lens focuses the image in front of the retina, while farsightedness occurs when the lens focuses the image behind the retina. Okay, so before we move into our next sensory system, I want to highlight two notable disorders that can come from damage to the brain, primarily damage to the occipital lobe. The first is prosopagnosia, also known as face blindness. This condition results from damage to the occipital and temporal lobes. Individuals with prosopagnosia lose the ability to recognize faces, even those of close friends and family. They can still see and describe facial features, but cannot identify whose face they are looking at. The last one is blind sight, which is a phenomenon that occurs when there is damage to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. Individuals with blind sight appear to be blind in part of their visual field, as they cannot consciously see or respond to visual stimuli in an area. However, they can still respond to certain visual stimuli without conscious awareness. For example, the individual might be able to navigate around obstacles or identify the location of a light source even though they claim they cannot see it. All right, now comes the time to talk about the auditory sensory system. If you do need more help with the visual system, you can check out the practice quiz in the ultimate review packet. Let's first talk about sound, which travels through the air as waves, through the movement of air molecules. The wavelength of a sound wave is the distance between two identical parts of a wave. For instance, the distance between two peaks. Now, in order to fully understand sound, we also need to talk about frequency and amplitude. 
Frequency is the number of waves that pass in a given point per second. This is what determines the pitch of the sound, which is the sound's highness or lowness. High frequency sound waves have short wavelengths and are perceived as high pitched sounds, while low frequency sound waves have long wavelengths and are perceived as low pitched sounds. Lastly, amplitude of a sound wave refers to the height of the wave, which is found by taking the distance from the peak or trough of the wave and measuring it from the equilibrium. Amplitude is the strength of the sound wave and determines the loudness of the sound. Greater amplitude means more energy and louder sounds, while smaller amplitude means less energy and a quieter sound. So since we've been talking about sound, we should also review sound localization. This is the process by which the brain determines the origin of sounds in our environment. It is what allows us to identify direction and distance of sounds. This is a complex process that involves the auditory system and several auditory cues to determine the direction and distance of sounds. Now, in trying to understand pitch and sound, we need to talk about three different theories. The place theory states that certain hair cells respond to certain frequencies. Hair cells that are located at the base of the cochlea can detect higher pitch sounds. While hair cells near the top of the cochlea can detect lower pitch sounds, with the hair cells at the very top near the spiral detecting the lowest pitch sounds. So the brain determines the pitch of the sound by identifying the specific location among the cochlea where the hair cells are activated. We can see that the place theory is most effective at explaining the perception of higher pitch sounds, but actually struggles with lower pitch sounds. The frequency theory states that the frequency of the auditory nerve's impulses correspond directly to the frequency of the sound wave. For instance, a sound wave with a frequency of 100 Hz would cause the auditory nerve to fire 100 times per second. This theory is best at explaining low pitch sounds. However, it is limited by the fact that individual neurons cannot fire faster than about a thousand times per second, while we can hear frequencies up to around 20,000 Hz. Lastly, the volley theory seeks to address the limitations of the frequency theory. It suggests that groups of neurons work together to fire in staggered manner, allowing them to collectively match the frequency of higher pitched sounds. All right, now the last part of the auditory system that we need to review is hearing loss. If an individual sees a decline in the clarity, loudness, and range of sounds and are no longer able to hear as they once did, it could indicate that the cilia in the auditory nerve may have been damaged. This type of hearing loss is known as sensory neural deafness. Whereas individuals with conductive deafness experience a blockage or damage that prevents sound from traveling efficiently from the outer ear to the middle ear and inner ear. If individuals are experiencing hearing loss, they can get a cochlear implant, which is a device that converts sounds into electrical signals. These signals help stimulate the auditory nerve and allow for signals to be sent to the brain. Or an individual could get a hearing aid, which amplifies sounds to allow an individual to hear different sounds around them. Now, I just mentioned the different parts of the ear. If you need a review on the different structures and functions of the ear, you can check out the ultimate review packet for an exclusive video and also a bonus quiz that goes over the auditory sensory system. Changing gears, we are now going to move on to the chemical sensory system. Starting with the process of smelling, we need to begin in the nose, where the olfactory receptors are located. These receptors are specialized nerve cells found in the olfactory epithelium, which is a small patch of tissue inside the nasal cavity. When odor molecules enter the nose, they bind to these receptors, which triggers a series of chemical reactions. Here, transduction occurs as chemical signals of odor molecules are converted into electrical signals that the brain can interpret. Unlike other senses, smell is unique because it does not pass through the thalamus, which remember is the brain's relay station for sensory information. Instead, the electrical signals generated by the olfactory receptors are sent directly to the olfactory bulb, then sent to various regions in the brain, including the olfactory cortex and the limbic system, which are involved in identifying and processing odors and emotions as well. This is why certain smells can evoke strong emotions or bring back specific memories. Now I reference parts of the nose and similar to our other senses, if you need to review the different structures and functions of the nose, you can check out the exclusive review video in the ultimate review packet that does just that. Again, I'm not including it in this video to try and keep the time down and because it's not specifically listed in the CD. 
All right, now one other concept you want to be familiar with with smell is pheromones, which are chemical signals released by an individual that affect the behavior or physiology of other individuals. Pheromones are detected by the olfactory system and play a significant role in attraction, social interaction, and communication within the same species. Moving on to the next chemical system, we have gustation, which is the term for the sense of taste, which consists of six different tastes. Sweet is associated with sugars and energy. Sour is typically caused by acidic substances and can tell us that food may have spoiled. Then there's bitter, which is associated with potentially toxic substances, and salty, which is due to the amount of sodium in the food. Lastly, there is unami and olgustus. Unami is also known as savory. It is the taste of the amino acid L-glutamate, which are found in foods like meat and cheese, so essentially protein, while olgustus, on the other hand, is associated with fats. This distinct taste helps in the detection of the presence of fatty acids in foods. Now, in order for you to experience these different tastes, we have to talk about your tongue, and more specifically the papillae, which are small structures located on your tongue that house our taste buds. There are four different types of papillae which allow you to experience the different types of taste. Each taste bud contains a variety of taste receptor cells that can detect taste. When we eat food, the food molecules dissolve in saliva and then bind to the receptors on the taste receptor cells. This triggers a chemical reaction that causes the taste receptor cells to release neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters stimulate sensory neurons, which transmit electrical signals to the brain. The signals go to the thalamus, which are sent to various parts of the brain, such as the limbic system and the gustatory cortex, which is the area responsible for the perception of taste. Now, when it comes to taste, we can see that the number of taste receptors on the tongue is related to how sensitive people are to taste. Generally, we can see that people fall into one of three categories when it comes to their taste. Super tasters are individuals that have a higher than average number of taste receptors. This allows them to experience taste more intensely. Then there's medium tasters who are individuals with an average number of taste receptors who have a more balanced sensitivity to different tastes. Lastly, there's non-tasters who are individuals that have fewer taste receptors, making them less sensitive to certain tastes. These individuals may not detect bitter flavors as strongly and might prefer foods with stronger flavors. One thing to remember when it comes to taste and smell is these two chemical senses interact closely to create the full sensation of flavor. Taste buds detect the basic taste while the olfactory receptors identify the aromas released from the food. Together, these inputs are processed by the brain to produce the different flavors that we experience. In fact, if you removed your smell, your taste sensations are either muted or not experienced. If you have muted taste sensations, it means that your perception of taste becomes significantly diminished. This happens because details on specific flavors and aromas of food are absent. For instance, we talked about earlier in this video what happens if you try Skittles without being able to smell them. Without your smell, they all start to taste the same. So that's our chemical sensory system. If you need more practice, you can check out the practice quizzes in the ultimate review packet. Now we're going to move on to our touch and pain sensory system. The skin is one of the largest organs of the body. The outside layer of your skin is the epidermis. This creates a barrier to protect a person from foreign pathogens and gives an individual their skin color. Below the epidermis is the dermis, which consists of two different layers. This is connective tissue that is where your blood vessels and nerve endings are located. This is also where you get your sense of touch and pain from. Lastly, underneath the dermis is the hypodermis, which is not really skin, rather it is a layer of fat that helps insulate an individual's tissues and absorbs shocks. When talking about touch, we're talking about four skin senses, pressure, warmth, cold, and pain. These give us our sense of touch. Our mechanical receptors are sensory receptors located in the skin that respond to pressure, while our thermoreceptors are sensory receptors that are located in the skin and respond to temperature changes. For instance, since the sensation of warmth or cold is produced by the activation of warmer cold receptors in the skin. When we encounter a hot stimuli, warm receptors are activated by an increase in the temperature. These receptors send signals to the brain indicating warmth. And when we are encountering a cold stimuli, cold receptors in the skin are activated. However, when we encounter extreme heat, our warm and cold receptors will become active. When both the warm and cold receptors are simultaneously activated, the brain interprets this mixed signal as a sensation of hot. 
This often occurs when the skin is exposed to high temperatures that excite both types of thermoreceptors. Depending on the amount of pressure or the warmth or cold of an object, we experience different sensations. When touch stimuli is detected by our receptors, it is converted from physical stimuli into electrical signals. These are then transmitted through the peripheral nervous system to the spinal cord and brain where the signals are sent to the thalamus and sent then to the appropriate regions of the brain, such as the somatosensory cortex, which processes and interprets incoming sensory information to help us perceive the touch. Now we also have nociceptors, which are located in the dermis. These are pain receptors. They are sensory receptors that detect harmful stimuli, such as extreme temperatures, damage, or chemical irritants. The key thing to remember about nociceptors is that they are involved with the sensation of pain. Speaking of pain, we need to talk about the gate control theory, which seeks to provide insight into how the body processes pain. The gate control theory suggests that the spinal cord contains a neurological gate that can either block pain signals or allow them to pass through to the brain. This gate is influenced by the relative activity of different types of nerve fibers. If the gate is open, pain signals can pass through and will be sent to the brain. But if the gate is closed, pain signals will be restricted from traveling to the brain. An individual's psychological state, attention, and other sensory inputs can influence the gate's activity. For instance, if an individual is distracted, it might reduce the pain perception by closing the gate. But when the person becomes more focused on the pain, the gate would open and cause the individual to experience more pain. And since we're on the topic of pain, I also want to talk about phantom limb sensation, which may occur with an individual who has lost a body part. Phantom limb sensation is when an individual experiences pain where the body part they lost used to be. There are different factors that could cause the sensation, the first being neurological. After amputation, the brain and spinal cord may still receive signals from the nerves that once served the missing limb. These nerves can become hyperactive or misinterpret other signals as coming from the missing limb. Another factor could be the brain. The brain has a map of the body, and even after a limb is lost, the corresponding area in the brain's map may remain active and produce sensations as if the limb was still there. Okay, now I know this video is long, but I knew you could do it. We are on the very last part, which is all about balance and movement. When you think of balance, think of the vestibular sense. When you move your head, the fluid inside the semicircular canals moves, causing the hair cells in the canals to bend, ultimately allowing you to maintain your balance, resulting in nerve impulses being sent to the brain, allowing your brain to understand the direction and speed of rotation. Now when you think of body movement, think of kinesthesis. This is the sense that provides information about the position and movement of individual body parts. This sensory system allows you to know where your limbs are in space and how they are moving without you having to constantly look at them. One of the ways in which the brain understands what is happening with our bodies is by using information from our proprioceptors. These are sensory receptors that are located in various muscles and tendons that allow allow for the brain to gain a better sense of position and movement of our limbs. When looking at the brain, we can see that the cerebellum plays a major role in coordinating voluntary movements, balance, and processing information on precise movements. All right, and just like that, you are done with Unit 1 of AP Psychology. Now comes the time to check your answers and take the Unit 1 practice quiz. Plus, don't forget to check out all of the other exclusive videos, resources, and practice quizzes found in the Ultimate Review Packet. Trust me, this packet will definitely help you get an A in your class and a 5 on the national exam. As always, I am Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.